today on this bonus episode of the Perception in Action podcast, an overview of the dynamical systems approach to becoming skillful, linking motor development and skill acquisition. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. On this episode, I want to look at an older article that I think everyone should be aware of, because it provides an excellent overview of the dynamical systems approach to skill acquisition and motor control. It is one by Jane Clark, published in the journal Research Quarterly for Exercise and Sport in 1995. This paper was based on the McCloy research lecture she gave at a conference. When trying to understand complex topics like dynamical systems, I find that it really helps if you can find someone that writes about it other than the main sources and the experts. In this case, someone other than people like Turvey, Kelso, and Newell. People coming at it from the outside, like us, often see things in a slightly different way that can strengthen the understanding you get from the main sources. In her article, Clark first emphasizes one of the main points that Carl Newell makes. That is, that there's a strong connection between motor development and skill acquisition. Quote, An adequate theory of becoming skillful cannot be realized by limiting our focus to one period in the lifespan or to tasks that are not rich in context and complexity and real in their adaptive significance. She notes that if you watch carefully, there are a lot of similarities between an infant struggling to take their first steps and an adult trying to learn a new sports skill like playing tennis. For example, she emphasizes how individual constraints influence learning in both of these cases. Quote, Just as the infant's maturational status is a component of the resulting behavior, so too must biological substrates play a role in adult motor skill acquisition and performance. Motor skill acquisition is the process of learning motor skills in the context of the performer's previous experience and biological status. Neither component has a privileged importance. How can we best understand the process of becoming skillful in these situations? As Clark notes, since about the 60s, explanations of skilled performance in adults have primarily been couched in an information processing framework, using a computer as a model for how our brain works. Just like a computer, we were thought to store and retrieve motor programs which control our actions. But Clark argues that this computer metaphor for skill is insufficient for a couple reasons. First, it relies on the assumption that we have an executive which selects which motor program to run, much in the same way a piano player selects a piece of music to play. But who is this executive? Where does he come from? And where does the motor program come from? The second problem with the information processing approach he identifies is the issue of complexity. Both the biological system in question, our body, and the environment in which it has to operate are highly complex and variable. While information processing approaches may work well for simple behaviors like in reaction time tasks in the lab, in Clark's opinion, they are ill-equipped to explain the versatility and adaptability of the skill we see in sport. The role of things like non-muscular forces, which I discussed in detail in the series on Bernstein, and the emergence of totally new movement patterns we sometimes see. In Clark's view, the alternative dynamical systems approach, which was brought to the movement sciences by Scott Kelso and colleagues in 1980, provides a much better account. The dynamical systems approach sees movement not as a prescription or program issued by a little man in our head or imposed by our genes during development. See my discussion of the traditional approach to motor development in episode 38. Rather, skilled movement is an emergent phenomenon that arises from the elements of a complex dynamical system. Clark then highlights the four critical components of the dynamical system's approach. Constraints, self-organization, patterns, and stability. As I discussed in detail back in episode 87, a critical idea in this approach is that motor behavior arises from a system that is surrounded by constraints, which limit or set boundaries for possible movement solutions. As described by Newell, these constraints come in three flavors, individual, environmental, and task. One type of environmental constraint that Clark emphasizes that I haven't really discussed much on the podcast are social cultural constraints. Reed has referred to these as a field of promoted action, that is, those actions that a culture promotes or nurtures. As an example of this, have a listen to the panel discussion I participated in on episode 136. 
In this, we bemoan the fact that the typical way that players and coaches are often being evaluated in many systems does place a significant cultural constraint on the ability to use constraints-based approaches in practice. Clark also does a good job emphasizing the importance of task constraints, which is really the main thing that a coach has control over. Quote, but it is the task of here and now that offers the final shape to a movement. Against the backdrop of the organism and environmental constraints, it's the requirements of the task at hand that ultimately forms the movement that we see. Picking up a cup from which to drink gives a reaching movement different from picking up an apple to eat. Task constraints marshal the system into the behavior we observe. From a dynamical systems perspective, movements emerge from constraints. The second key concept in the dynamical systems approach, according to Clark, is self-organization. As she emphasizes, constraints are not enough to give us movement. There must be some process which organizes the components of our perception action system in the face of these constraints. This process is self-organization. The idea here is that the elements of a complex system will spontaneously develop organization or patterns based on the governing dynamical principles. That is, they will self-organize. Quote, For example, energetic systems that are far from a state of equilibrium will find a stable equilibrium point, and therefore an organization under certain set of constraints. No little man in the brain is needed to command the system to organize in a specific way. Rather, a pattern emerges from the constraints through the process of self-organization. The third critical component is one I just mentioned, patterns. The idea here is that within our perception action system, we have billions of neurons and thousands of motor units. But due to the process of self-organization, we don't need to describe what each of these is doing to understand behavior. From this highly complex system, a pattern, or what's called a low-dimensional description, emerges. An example of this can be seen when we look at the phase relationship between the legs when adults walk. Although walking involves a large number of muscles, motor units, neurons, etc., we can describe walking using a low-dimensional description, the phase relationship between the two legs. Specifically, adults typically have a 180-degree phase relationship with the footfall of one leg falling exactly halfway between the footfall of the other. Identifying these patterns involves creating a state space, which identifies all possible states a system can be in. Attractors are formed when the system is drawn to specific regions of the state space, like as we will see in the moment, the 180 degree phase relationship in walking. The fourth critical component Clark discusses is stability. Attractors to represent stable states of a dynamical system. That is, when the system is in that location in state space, it is resilient to small perturbations in the environment. For example, in walking, stepping on a small rock might move the system away from a 180-degree phase relationship temporarily, but it would quickly return to this within a few steps. In other words, stable patterns are very low in variability. The loss of stability, resulting in high variability, is a characteristic of a system in transition to a new movement solution. For example, in infants when crawling, which is itself a stable behavior for extended period, gives way to another stable solution, walking. Why might this transition occur? Well, because behaviors emerge from constraints, it follows that any change in the pattern of self-organization can be attributed to a change in one or more of the constraints. Associated with this is a very important concept, which I think Clark gives a fantastic definition of, a control parameter. Quote, Further, because behaviors emerge from constraints, it follows that changes in a pattern can be attributed to changes in one or more constraints. When scaling a constraint changes a system, that constraint is referred to as a control parameter. In other words, when we systematically change a constraint, for example increasing the spacing between players on a field, if that changes the pattern that emerges in the system, then that constraint is a control parameter in that system. Clark next goes on to describe how she has applied a dynamical systems approach to understand the behavior she is interested in, walking in infants. Another reason that I really like this paper is that Clark gives an excellent review of the research strategy proposed by Scott Kelso when using a dynamical systems approach. Specifically, to understand a behavior using this approach, we need to first seek out a low dimensional description of the system, like a phase relationship, to identify attractors in the system like the 180-degree phase relationship. Next, 
The attractor can be examined for stability and instability by perturbing constraints to identify potential control parameters. Turning to Clark's example of infant walking, Esther Thelen identified eight components that must reach some level of maturity before an infant can have the necessary organism or individual constraints before walking will emerge. These are pattern generation, articular differentiation, postural control, visual flow sensitivity, tonus control, extensor strength, body constraints, and motivation. If one or more of these components or constraints has not reached some critical level, then another important concept comes into play, a rate limiter. A rate limiter is a variable which serves to hold back the emergence of a new behavior. Following Kelso's research plan, Clark and her colleagues first sought to identify a collective, low-dimensional variable that could capture the complex behavior of walking. Key to doing this, as she describes, is narrowing the scope to focus on one aspect of behavior. In this case, coordination between the two limbs or interlimb coordination. As I discussed a few moments ago, interlimb coordination in adult walking can be nicely described as a 180-degree phase relationship. This acts as an attractor for walking around which the behavior is stabilized. An important point to mention here is an issue related to variability that Clark does not really get into. As I discussed a few moments ago, once an attractor is established in state space, there tends to be low variability around it. And that is what we see in adult walking. If we look at how much the phase relationship between the legs varies as a percentage, it's only about 1-2% to in adults, so very small. So you might be thinking to yourself now, doesn't this go against everything I've been talking about in terms of variability on the podcast? Things like high variability being good for adaptability, repetition without repetition, etc. Does it suggest that there's just one technique for walking, consistent with the motor program idea? The answer to these questions is no, because we're describing the behavior in terms of phase. Just because we're stable around 180 degrees does not mean that the feet fall in the exact same place with every stride. It's still possible to adapt to different terrains, etc., and maintain this phase relationship. Returning to Clark's work, if adults have this stable 180 degree relationship, what do infants do when they start walking? Surprisingly, they also tend, on average, to have the same phase relationship. This suggests that a symmetrical alternating pattern of coordination, i.e. a 180-degree relationship, is just the easiest solution for a two-legged walker to use. However, there is a difference when we look at stability. Remember, adults have a variance of about 1-2%. to For new walkers, Clark found this value to be about 9-10%, to with it reducing systematically with age to about 3% after 6 months of walking. So clearly, although infants start with the same coordination solution as adults, it is highly unstable and needs to be stabilized through practice. Why might there be instability in the solution? Again, if we see differences in the self-organization of a system, it's going to be caused by some change in a constraint. So what is the change in constraint or control parameter that drives the stabilization of walking? Through several observations, Clark proposed that it's the ability to maintain posture. For example, if this constraint is altered by the experimenter supporting the walking infant, the gait pattern stabilizes. This can also be seen in how often both feet are in contact with the ground while walking. For adults, this occurs about 20% of the gait cycle, while for new walkers, it's about 60% again pointing to posture as a control parameter, or if you want, a rate limiter in coordination. So again, following Kelso's research plan, after we identify an attractor, the next step is to explore stability by perturbing the system around it. When a system is stable, it should resist perturbation, while if it's unstable during a transition phase, for example between crawling and walking, it's likely to be highly susceptible to be pushed around. To do this, Clark and colleagues put ankle weights, about 5% of the body weight, on one leg of the walker. The effect was strong for infants. For new walkers, this led to them refusing to walk altogether or just being able to walk three or four steps without falling over. After one month of experience with walking, the ankle weight had no effect on the number of steps. Results were a little bit different when they looked at intra-limb coordination, for example between the upper and lower parts of the same leg. This time, when the system was perturbed by adding a weight to the shank of one leg, it resulted in a coordination pattern that was more similar to adults. So, the weight did not seem to destabilize the infant, 
but rather pushed them into an area of state space they were not able to achieve before, much in the same way that a coach manipulating constraints can allow an athlete to reach a movement solution they were unable to attain previously. To end, Clark discusses how this walking example, although typically classified as a developmental problem, captures all the principles of the dynamical systems approach to acquiring a new skill. Quote, The first of these principles is that behaviors emerge from the constraints that surround them. When a behavior first emerges in the infant's repertoire, that behavior emerges from the organism, environment, and task constraints of the moment. Another way to frame this principle is to examine the effect that changing constraints have on behavior. In our work, we can demonstrate one clear piece of evidence on this point, namely the finding is on interlimb coordination when the infants are supported. Providing postural support stabilizes the phasing relationship between the legs such that our new walkers look like they've been walking for about one month. A second principle on skill acquisition that emerges from the dynamical system perspective is that dynamic patterns are the appropriate units of analysis. Indeed, the process of learning a skill may be conceptualized as the process of finding an attractive dynamic state that meets the task demands. Many attractive states are possible. For example, crawling is an attractive dynamic state as is standing or cruising along the couch. But to walk, the infant must find the constraints that will hold together a hands-free, bipedal, propulsive state. The third principle that is illustrated in this story on learning to walk is that the behaviors in transition are unstable. Although motor learning theories have classically seen variability as a nuisance or a source of error, within a dynamical system's perspective, variability is not only expected, but it's a critical property of the system. Stable patterns represent behavioral states that are reproducible and independent of each other. As the system passes from one state to another, there is a period of instability. Variability then points to the times when the system is in a state of transition. It also reveals a time when the potential relevance of a constraint as a control parameter can be explored. But most important, the dynamical system perspective highlights the importance of a system that is not constant nor fixed, but rather dynamic, variable, and adaptive. To learn, a stable state must give way to a new state. Crawling must give way so that the infant can find the region of the dynamical landscape where walking is the attractive and ultimately stable behavior. Okay, that's it for this month's bonus episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a million for supporting the podcast. I really appreciate it. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Is this the way?